Welcome to Cut Off Jeans, the podcast that helps you find your truth using nothing but DNA. I'm Julie Dixon Jackson, and I'm a genetic genealogist, henceforth known as a Gen Genie. And I am Richard Castle, the producer, co pilot, co host, sidecar rider, sidecar rider, si- sidecar drinker. <laughs> <laughs> What's in a sidecar? I don't know, but I always love, like, people always order it with something. Like, Do oh, they? Yes. Have you ever seen anybody order a sidecar? Uh, well, really? Truth be told, it was Auntie Mame. <laughs> And uh, folks, that's not my auntie name. I didn't have one, unfortunately. Oh, everybody <laughs> We're should have an auntie with name. Rosalind Russell. Yeah. yeah, really good movie. You know, I imagine ordering a sidecar if I'm having dinner at what's that steakhouse on on uh, Sunset Boulevard that on no one Hollywood Boulevard that's been around for years. Oh, Musso and Frank. Yes, Musso yes. and Frank. I would have a sidecar there. Oh yeah, that's the kind of place where that's you the can... kind of place where you have a sidecar and yeah. a steak. Well. Anyway, let's maybe we'll take a break and go make ourselves a sidecar. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the Super Bowl was this past weekend. I don't know when you're all listening to it. And um, I should have really been interested because I'm from Boston. Mm-hmm. So they're the and you live in L.A. I live in L.A. with the Rams. And unfortunately, I couldn't have cared less. I, you know, I literally didn't even get close to flipping over to it. I went to the movies, which <laughs> Sorry, is like what, what like we Jewish people do at, on Christmas. Yes, I consider going to the mall because that would have been the best time to Yeah, there'd the be mall. nobody there, yeah. right? Right. So, uh, yeah, so I went to the movies and I saw that movie with Melissa McCarthy, the Can You Ever Forgive Me? Oh, I have oh, screeners of that. Yeah, it was. it's really good. Is it good? It's okay. really worth watching. But, you know, it was interesting how this DNA podcast bleeds over into my real life. Uh-huh. And then I'm watching it and, you know, she plays someone who, who forges... Um, signatures of um, famous people and, and oh. she sells them, you know? Okay. So, um, and I was, all I kept thinking was, oh, if they could do the DNA on this, they would realize that, that it wasn't, it really wasn't Dorothy Parker that signed this. It was uh, a fraud. Do the DNA on what? Uh, you know, on the, uh, on the letter itself, you know, like. Oh, she, uh, she okay. So it's like she sent them in letters. Yeah. And, they were like, uh, you know, she, she was dealing in like rare, um, rare letters from famous people. Interesting. Right. And it's a true story or based on a true story. So, Oh, I have to watch that. Oh, it's, you'll love it. Okay, but good. anyway, but here I am sitting there in the theater going, Hmm, what about the DNA? <laughs> <laughs> Don't think of that, Richard. Just enjoy the movie. <laughs> I actually have something coming up in a future episode, maybe even today, about um, about uh, that kind of testing, the, what is it called? Artifact testing. It's like that old tale that we talked about, you know, about somebody wanting to get their grandfather's DNA off of a postage stamp or something. Exactly. Remember? Yeah. Yes, it's coming. Cool. It's, it's here, actually. Cool. We'll talk about it later. All right, here's a story I read on Bloomberg, which uh, talks to me. So, surprise DNA results are turning customer service reps into therapists. Really? <laughs> it makes sense. So in consumer DNA testing, customer service is sometimes a lot more like emotional support. Though genetic tests are frequently marketed as family-friendly entertainment, they sometimes wind up surfacing life-altering surprises. Don't we know that? Right. And when those surprises show up in someone's test results, the first move is to call customer service. Oh, right. That's what yeah. I did. That's what I did. I well, was like, like, this has to be a like, mistake. Like, what does this mean? Or, yeah, yeah, I'm like, no, this has happened before, right? Somebody else, somebody else just called you and says that they have the wrong results. You switched them. Wow. That's what happened when, when Malcolm, not my dad, came back as not my dad. At 23 and Me, those types of calls are so frequent that preparing for them is integrated into the company's months-long training program. The most common issue is when a customer's presumed father doesn't show up, and NPE, everybody, as the genetic dad, but sometimes mothers or siblings are a surprise too. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's like they have to be bartenders too, right? You know, they have to hear your troubles. Or hairdressers. Hairdressers. Yeah. Or quite frankly, piano players. Oh, sure. Because I am, when I'm playing piano in a bar bar or a restaurant and people come up and tell me their problems. Like Billy Joel. (laughs) It's it's true. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. And they come up and tell me their stories and then I have to listen to them and I can't get away because I'm stuck at the piano. You know... (laughs) As uh, some of you know that I'm a hairdresser to boot, and uh, I have had people tell me the most horrifying things while sitting in my chair. When you said to boot, all I could think of was like those those uh, boots that have hair on them, like the, like horse hair or whatever. I'm like, <laughs> Julie does hair on boots? <laughs> <laughs> this is where my mind goes. Oh, you're a nut. I know. Okay. <laughs> anyway, getting back to uh, customer services therapists, 
Okay, it says, uh, how most of those conversations start is people come to us to verify the accuracy. Somebody's known something their whole life, and then this company is telling them something different. It's tough. And then it's like, hey, I'm uh, heading to a Thanksgiving dinner. Can you help me out with this before I go have this conversation with my mother? Wow. I can't imagine asking somebody that. But even even though they work for that company, I wouldn't think that they could help me with something that personal. Well, I think people still are in disbelief and they want... See, so when it happened to me, I was waiting. I said, okay, so this happens all the time, right? You know, And I was expecting her to say, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. But instead, she was like, I'm so sorry you found out this way. Oh, well, that's, you know. And I was like, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm different. Yeah. You know, and, but you could tell that they're trained to say, you know, and they just have to listen and let you vent and present you with science. And uh, somebody said, we always try to steer the conversation toward the data, telling them that it's science. Rather than the, than the emotions. And yeah. Exactly. Sure. Right. Leave that for the real therapists, right? Yeah. Look, had I known that I could get therapy by calling customer service at you know Ancestry, I would have saved myself a lot of money with therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, so, a customer care representative at Twenty Three and Me remembers one call in particular years later. Oh, this is sad. A dad who took the test only to find out that his child was not, in fact, his child. At first, like most, he was just trying to figure out whether the results were accurate. So Grove explained, that's the person who was telling the story, the science behind the data. The customer then became somber and quiet. He questioned whether he should talk to his wife and if he did, how. Oh, well, of course he should talk to his wife. Right. You know. Um, It was an online chat reply from uh, an Ancestry DNA customer service rep that ripped Catherine St. Clair's life apart. We've heard of her because, you'll see, um, she is her family's resident genealogist and had sent her to saliva to Ancestry for testing. When her brother Mike showed up as a first cousin or close relative, she assumed it must be a glitch. Even stranger, the test showed up that someone she had never heard of was a much closer genetic match than Mike. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She contacted customer service um, through the website's chat feature, and the representative calmly, her name was Pam, explained Santa Morgan's. Uh, a They're unit, always named Pam. Aren't they? Come on, <laughs> Pam. <laughs> a unit of Pam, measuring. Pam, not her real name. <laughs> I bet it is. They're all named. You or I right? They're yeah. all, yeah. all named They're Pam. all named Pam. Yeah. Um, Which, you know, Pam spelled backwards is Map. map. Oh my gosh. Light bulb moment. Right. They're giving you a little roadmap I to think your I'm DNA. This, I think I'm giving this war, more weight than is necessary. Well, it's still, it's, it's interesting. I, I would never have thought about this, but of course, <laughs> yes, these customer reps are, have to be de facto therapists. Yeah. Right. So she told her that uh, it's normal to share about 2,600 centimorgans of DNA if you're a full sibling and half-siblings share an average of 1,800. Mm. And there's just no way around that. Right. Um, and she told her to go click on the little icon by his name, and it'll tell you how much you share. And when she clicked on it, the floor fell out from under her. Mike oh. wasn't her full brother. So she is the person, the lady who ended up uh, starting the NPE Facebook group oh, wow. that so many of our listeners are members of okay. now because she at that time felt completely alone. So now there's a place to go to chat and to get, you know. And it's growing daily. Oh, I bet. Just over the holidays. Uh, I think it's doubled in membership. It's a little scary. Um, but, yeah, she found out that this other person uh, was another half-sibling who matched higher than her half-sibling that she thought was her full sibling. Mm. Yeah. And. Uh, Surprise. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens. Well, so I, you know, it makes sense. It's so funny when I read this story. I was like, "Yeah, that's exactly what they said to me." Yeah. <laughs> so they they hear it on a daily basis. Okay, so here's something interesting from BuzzFeed News that I saw this week. And BuzzFeed is always <laughs> accurate, apparently. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. I knew it. Go on. Okay, let's not. Um, Okay, so in a commercial going viral this week, the airline Aeromexico unveiled a clever business strategy that also pokes fun at fears about the border. 
The airline is supposedly giving Americans discounted airfare to Mexico based on how much Mexican DNA they have. <laughs> That's funny. It's just one problem. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's an impossibility to really identify anyone's DNA to be Mexican. I'm doing finger, crow- okay. uh, finger quotes. Um, said Blaine Bettinger, our friend Blaine Bettinger. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. He was interviewed for this. Uh, it's unclear if the ad is satire. <laughs> I think it probably is. I think, considering yeah. what's going on, I think it's a very funny satire. Right, actually. but the airline did not requir- return a request for comment to BuzzFeed. Oh. Yeah, but even if it is, Bettinger said the premise is an extreme oversimplification of what DNA tests can reveal about your heritage. Um, in a two minute, it's a two minute ad, so it must just be airing online. Right. I mean, who watches a two minute ad unless it's like for the Super Bowl? I wonder if it'll air during the Super Bowl. I don't know. There's going to be an uproar. Does Aero Mexico have that much money to air during air something during the Super well, Bowl? Well, they have they have money to discount people's uh, flights based on their DNA. So that's, I don't know. That's so interesting. I mean, I, it's I think it's a joke. Of course it is, yeah. and I think even the fact that people are would be taking it seriously. Well, it, it, I watched this ad, okay, and it's interesting because uh, I'll I'll read this in the two minute ad. Aero Mexico representatives asked Texas residents why, despite their penchant for tequila and burritos, they don't want to visit Mexico. <laughs> As one man puts it, let me say, let me stay here in peace and let those folks stay on their side of the border. Well, there you go. Charming. Yeah. I would yeah. never think in a, in a million years that they were actually offering a discount for your Mexican heritage. I mean, I think that's, they're, they're clearly making a, a, a point here. Yeah. The know? more Mexican they are, the more discount they get. The airline claims it gave out discounts through its travel agencies in the Southwest from Texas to Nevada, and 54% of the tests of these states had Mexican DNA. <laughs> Comedy ensues. One man, upon being told he's 22% Mexican and eligible for 22% discount to fly to Mexico, responds, that's BS. <laughs> He said the real word, but I was I cleaned it up for you. The, he doesn't want the discount. Apparently not. No, because it might mean that he has some Mexican ancestry. <sighs> okay, a lot of people love the ad, declaring it should win a Troll of the Month award. <laughs> that sounds about right. Um, so. Let me go back to what Blaine said. Genetic genealogy testing is a lot more complicated than that. DNA based ancestry companies do a good job of distinguishing between different continents like Asia, the Americas, Europe, and Africa. But beyond that, it's difficult to drill down the specific countries or regions, he said. Uh, That's especially true of the Americas, Mexico, as well as the United States, Canada, and Central and South America, because their populations historically made up uh, are made up of immigrants from all parts of the world. People who live in Mexico could have ancestors from Italy, for example. Sure. Um, but that ancestry doesn't make them any less Mexican. Mexico is no less of a melting pot than the United States. There is no such thing as United States DNA, so why would there be Mexican DNA? Exactly, yeah, yes. It doesn't make sense. Um, some companies might be able to identify a customer as having ancestors from the indigenous populiza- populations. Right. Excuse me. Um, well, like not all Australians are indigenous people. They came from most other places. Aren't. Most aren't. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But there are still a lot of Mexicans who don't have indigenous DNA. So when you are, when um, uh, people are, most Mexicans that I test or that I have test or I've, whose results I've looked at, they're... Uh, a lot of their DNA says Native American. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because it's continental. Right, right. And you of know. course, the, you know, the uh, Native Americans didn't um, think about borders when they were crossing between what is now the yeah. United States and Mexico. Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. Um, is it wrong that, like, as you talk about this, I'm getting hungry and, like, want to go for out burritos? For, for a burrito? That sounds really good. I know chips and salsa. I'm, and a margarita. Ugh. Or you know what? Even better yet, like a trip to Puerto Vallarta. (gasps) (laughs) And have a margarita on the beach. Let's go. Let's do it. All right. If you're enjoying Cut Off Jeans, please subscribe, rate, and review. Now, back to Julie and me. Okay. So we've been hearing a lot lately about people who are having difficulty uh, taking DNA from elder relatives or babies. Um, it's just hard for them to produce enough spit. Oh, I was going to say, isn't it like taking stealing candy from a baby? Is that how hard is that? Just take the baby and swab him. <laughs> well, funny you should say that <laughs> because there is a way to do it. Um, 
for senior citizens and babies uh, to kind of, um, it's a hack to create a kind of fake spit. Don't, I'm sorry, this is going to sound terrible, but don't babies and old people just drool all the time? Can't you get Yeah, but how can you make it so they don't eat for a half an hour or drink water? And (laughs) Oh, and then drool? I see. (laughs) You have to like, it has to be very controlled. Right. So somebody devised uh, a way of, of kind of hacking, taking DNA from somebody who can't produce enough spit. Oh, well, I'd be interested to hear that. Well, let me tell you. It involves, uh, so basically you get a regular test kit. It works with Ancestry DNA. That was how it was started, but apparently it also works with 23andMe. I don't know why it wouldn't. Um, so you need the kit. You need a syringe, like a measuring syringe. Um, those tiny nylon, like Christmas tree toothbrushes things that you get, like oh. in a package of eight. Yes. You get those. You're going to use all eight of those. You need a saline solution. Okay. To make the artificial saliva, I think... Um, a solution to my saline problem? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. um, you, I, I think Simply Saline was one that was recommended, whatever. And then you need some distilled water. You need three disposable cups and... Um, this, sounds, this sounds like a lot. I think I just need a new relative who could produce <laughs> some spit. It's actually not that. But basically like what you do... Distilled water? Come on. Oh, come on. Distilled water is cheap. <laughs> I always have distilled water in my house to use in my iron. Really? You have to use distilled water in your iron. Oh, well, I haven't ironed uh, in 20 years, so, you know. <laughs> That's because you're not a housewife like me. <laughs> yeah, no, but I Because I'm a traditional housewife. Obviously, I'm sitting here in wrinkled clothing and, and, <laughs> and suffering from your judgment. <laughs> Who's all? Uh, you're. I'm not going to give you the exact instructions because I'm going to send you to a place where we'll show you the exact instructions but it basically you're making a solution um of of fake spit and then you're swabbing you're using those little toothbrush things to swab the inside of whomever's mouth it is whose dna you want to get and you soak it into the solution and you basically have uh, a kit that works and for this person who shows us how to do it on youtube uh it has never failed her and it works Anyway, I'm going to put a link to that YouTube video um, of the lady who does it. And I'm sure that'll get you to links to other ones. I'm sure she's not the only one who does it, but it was the one that was that uh, first came to my attention. I and th- I'll put does it Does she on have there. an old person that she does? Like, she a, has a baby that she oh, does. Oh, a baby. Okay. Yeah, a right. baby or a small child. All right. Anyway, so um, it's... A very cool thing, you guys, because a lot of people have said, well, let's do, you know, FTDNA does swabs, but um, of course, a lot of people don't want to use FTDNA because of what happened recently. Right. Well, I won't bring up the ethical <laughs> d- dilemma let's of the not. fact that a child and a baby cannot give his consent, his or her consent. Yes, but it's somebody, their their parent is doing it. Yes. So, so it's, you know. Don't even start with Wait me. until you're 18. <laughs> <laughs> But a lot of people do it who have adopted children sure. that no, want to help the children know their own I, no, I'm, I'm Don't there. start with me, Rich. <laughs> okay. You know me. I'm always devil's advocate. <laughs> All right. So that's a fun thing. And uh, I'd love to hear from you guys who do it, uh, how it worked out for you, because I'm excited about it. Hey, let's do a book nook. Oh, I love the book nook. That's book a fairly nook. new thing here. It is. It is. This is a book that I'm actually reading right now that I think anyone in the adoption triad should read. And um, it's actually, I was prompted to read it when we were talking about, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about trying to have some kind of campaign to help biological mothers. To have them not feel the shame that they yes, have to have carried them, with them yes, their to, whole life. to release the stigma that they have felt all their life. Yes. And so this book is by Anne Fessler, and it's called The Girls Who Went Away. It's from 2006. And what it basically is, is a series of interviews or conversations that she had with adoptive mothers. Whoops. It's time for an instant clarification corner. Julie meant to say... Biological mothers, not adoptive mothers. Uh, Talking about their experience, um, let me see. I'll just read this. In this deeply moving and myth-shattering work, Anne Fessler brings out into the open for the first time the astonishing untold history of the million and a half women who surrendered children for adoption due to enormous family and social pressure in the decades before Roe v. Wade. 
an adoptee who, uh, who was herself surrendered during those years and recently made contact with her mother. Fessler brilliantly brings to life the voices of more than 100 women as well as the spirit of those times, allowing the women to tell their stories in a gripping and intimate detail. That sounds fascinating. It is, and I've been reading it, and it's, you know, I thought I was real, uh, you know, I know what it's like, I know what, what but it, hearing... Uh, the description coming from these women who have been through it themselves, and again, all of their stories are different but similar. Right, and right. Uh, it kind of brings it home, and it helps me. It, it helps me understand my biological mother a little more. Sure, too, right. because there's even always though, more than one side to the story, right? Absolutely, and even though she was very welcoming, it wasn't like there was shame involved when I found her that she didn't, you know. Correct. She right. wanted to forget about it. It still, I think, is really important. And in my work of finding biological families, I kind of want to make it a part of the process. I think maybe if I find, because I, I'm, I'm still experiencing biological families that are that don't want anything to do with this because they were told it was a secret and we don't want to. Um, right. I think this would help a lot of those people too to come around and uh, realize that they're not alone. I think that's very a very good idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I think the whole idea of that public campaign and all that is also really good be- to get people to feel like they're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to feel like they're the only one with this. This is a secret I have to keep because right. I'm the only one and it's, they're shame. And it and, happens so much and it happened... I mean, there are so many women still walking around with that secret that are absolutely petrified of it being being coming out in the open. You know. Yeah, let's open it up. All open right. it up. <laughs> so guys, it's called The Girls Who Went Away by Anne Fessler and check it out if you have anybody in your, buddy in your life who is dealing with this or has a a, a family member who's dealt with this. Uh, I think it's a great. It is a little triggering. I'm sure. All of these are a little triggering, sure. I find. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, knowledge is power, and anything that I can hear or learn from people who have been through this, I think is valuable or invaluable. I agree. I'm triggered by trigger. Trigger triggers me too. Well, you know, trigger the horse, as we know, <laughs> didn't know his biological parents, <laughs> and so you know, I get triggered by that. He didn't know his sire. <laughs> Or his foal. Wait, what's he a, was the foal. Oh, he was the foal. The foal is the baby. Oh, my God. How did we make this? How did we turn this into an ugly, ugly thing? Yeah, you know what? This is a foal's errand. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Please take a break. I need to go and wash uh, my ears out. Thank you for listening to Cut Off Jeans, the new podcast starring Julie Dixon Jackson. Okay, welcome back. Hello. How was your break? It was wonderful. I haven't recovered from what just happened before it. Oh no. It was it was it was a little much for me. W- w- what happened? We started doing puns. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so do you have do you have one for us then? No. You don't. Oh, I is that what you're going for? No. Oh, you know what? You've saddled me with having to get more horse puns. <laughs> See what I did? You t- see, you can you can do it on the fly or on the horse. You know what? I'm going to take this by the reins. You can do it on the horse fly. Into- <laughs> that sounds like a that sounds like a, a Groucho Marx thing. A horse fly. We were talking about foals right earlier. Yeah, I don't know. You know what it is? Fo- no, foals rush in. Fools rush in. I'm going to pull out my cold. Or angels horse fear to tread. And- <laughs> no, I'm a musician. I know these songs. Holes uh, rush in. So I, I I understand we have part two of an interview coming up. Oh, we do. Yes. Way to change that subject, Rich. <laughs> nice save. Uh, yeah, we do. We have part two of our interview with Sharon McKee. Yes, I've been waiting all week to hear it. So. I bet you have. <laughs> um, so if you recall last week, she was telling us about the story of how she was conceived uh, by a gentleman who came from a, a well-to-do family and... Uh, he was actually prosecuted and acquitted of, um, what was it, bastardy? <laughs> yeah. But he was guilty of fornication, but acquitted of bastardy, so she became a ward of the state, and her mother basically had to live with you know, this judgment for the rest of her life. Unbelievable. Yeah. So um, I'm just amazed that this... That, that sounds like something you would hear from 
1920s or 30s or prior to that even, you know, yeah. not not from the 60s. Well, you've seen those lists. There are laws that are still in uh, in the books now that are ridiculous and archaic, but they haven't bothered to change them. Right. Such, but that doesn't something mean... about like, you know, not you're not it's illegal to walk a chicken on the street in in Nashville. Or oh, my something. God. I got arrested for that once. <laughs> Walking your chicken. Yeah, but luckily I was able to convince the judge it was a rubber chicken, and it, so it, it was okay. I think they got me off with a slap on the hand. <laughs> Good thing you weren't tarred and feathered. <laughs> they got, got me off with a slap of the chicken. <laughs> hey, guys, let's listen to the second half of, oh, gosh, of Sharon McKee's interview. Thank you so much, Sharon, and I'm sorry we're uh, – we're going off topic, but <laughs> guys, listen to this. It's an amazing story and it makes me cry. And so then I went to a genealogy conference in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and met Josh Taylor okay. of Genealogy Roadshow. And he's like, he, he was terrific. He said, I'll do anything I can to help you. He said, but you really need to fish in all three ponds yep. and, and do 23 and me. So I did that. The results came back in June, and it showed an anonymous first cousin. And that was on 23 and I could Okay. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, but my responses to the first cousin, uh, you know, I never received any, uh, you know, any response. Yeah. And so at that time, you could only email an anonymous uh, relative up to three times, and then they would stop it. Oh, okay. I mean, that was twenty three and me. You could. Yeah. So it was like I, I couldn't take too many risks on on like losing potential contact. So yeah. I realized I'm going to have to do this on my own. Mm-hmm. So because I knew they were from Canada, I started searching all my twenty three and me matches for Canada. I mean, this goes on for. I mean, this was an eleven month. 10 to an 11 month, well, we'll say 10 month process. Mm-hmm. And so anybody who put down Canada that I had any DNA shared with, uh, I would write to. Good. The very last person where we shared like 0.17%, she was the very last person on the list, wrote back saying, yes, I think my many times great grandmother had a sister with the last name you're looking for. Oh. And, and she connected me with her elderly aunt, her elderly great aunt in Alberta, Canada, who supplied me with even more information. At the same time, I'm uh, working with someone from the Manitoba Historical Society in Winnipeg, Canada. So see, now we're, we're, we're outside the country. You know, we're in yeah. Canada yeah. working on this. And they provided me a wealth of information, and I had absolute documentation then showing that these two women were sisters. So if I was related to, we'll say, Chris, and Chris's great-grandmother, many times great-grandmother, is sisters with my father's many times great-grandmother, well, I have to be related to him. Right. So with that, uh, with that information, then I e- I wrote a very lengthy letter to one of the first cousins that I saw via a Facebook that I knew was a first cousin to me. Gotcha. And sent her all the materials, uh, and just said, "I I think I'm your genetic first cousin." I mean, I, I did an introduction, but that's basically what I said. Yeah. And I was not sure what I, what kind of response I was going to get. Yeah, you never know. Uh, yeah, you really don't know. <laughs> two, two days later, I got an email saying, hi, cousin. <gasps> and I, I mean, my heart just sang, <sighs> hearing, hear, seeing this beautiful email saying that she was happy to take, a, you know, a DNA test, that oh, she was so sorry great. to hear what I... Yes, sorry to hear with what what I went through. Uh, hap- and then and then that weekend we talked for the first time. She gave me lots of medical history. Uh, said you know she wanted to meet me, and we would subsequently then do the twenty three and Me test. And get this, it did not show that we were first cousins. Half siblings. 
half siblings. Because she's the twin brother's daughter. Uh, my yeah, my father's my father's sister. Actually. Oh, okay. no, actually, yeah, no. Because no, the twins, because you know, identical twins, their children usually match as half siblings because they we, have we such are. similar DNA. Okay. Yeah, I I, yeah. I do have a cut. One of my one of my father's identical twins' daughter. That makes sense. Yes. A cousin, a cousin who is the daughter of my father's identical twin. We're at, yes. I want to say, 22 and Ooh, a half. Ooh, that's close. Uh, yeah, that's but, high. But the cousin who is the daughter of my father's sister, we were at 19.1. I mean, because we, we know that first cousins have a range of 8 to 18 and a yeah, half. Yeah, yeah, with, that's a percentage. With 12 and a half. Right. And so, yes, it was the percentage of 19.1. Gotcha. So, I mean, she was thrilled because she only had two brothers and she's like, I've always wanted a sister. Mm. So but that, that was amazing. It's been amazing to see how much DNA I share with my father's family. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, a, now I've, I've met one of my second cousins and she and I are double DNA have a double uh, amount of DNA compared to a second cousin I have on my mother's side. Right. So my cousin and I then met again, uh, and she brought tons of scrapbooks, and I saw all these people staring back at me mm. that I was related to. Ugh. And and just learned so, it, it filled in so much that, I, and, and answered so many questions for me that, you know, it, it, was, extra, it was an extraordinary um, thing to happen. It was, I feel very blessed, very grateful to finally have that missing part answered. Mm-hmm. But then my uh, cousin then said, you know, you need to write your dad a letter, your father a letter, and tell him about this DNA testing. Did that. And, you know, he called her and they had a conversation and she sort of brokered our first conversation that we would have. Okay. okay. And that would that's occur. That's a good way June. to put it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but that's, that, it was brokered. Yeah, yes, I like it. It definitely was brokered. Yep. Uh, it's not like it was like, oh, yay. Right. It, you know, there, it wasn't that kind of really, it wasn't uh, that type of response. Sure. Uh, but we ended up speaking for the first time in life. Uh, in January of 2016, and you know, he invited us to to visit him uh, down in Florida. And each week, uh, he and I would start to talk. And over a three month period, uh, you know, we were starting to form uh, a relationship. And it, so, when I met him for the first time, he was uh, in his mid 80s. So I, I feel very grateful that he was still alive, mm-hmm. that I finally got to meet the phantom father because mm-hmm. he was always present. I will tell you, he was always present. He just wasn't there. Yep. I mean, and he would have no idea that he had had this type of effect. Of course um, not. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and he and he simply says, you know, uh, it's the jury's fault. Right. You know, and uh, he regrets the jury's decision. Okay. And, uh, but again, my mother would be so thrilled that his family knows about this, friends know about this, uh, you know, and that she is now vindicated. Yes. So important. And, you know, I I, I cannot, I, I am so grateful to be alive during a time when we have this genetic genealogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I've been able to prove my paternity. Yep. I, I, I wish the jurors could still be alive, that they would know. Yeah. That they would know this. Is uh, there anything I, you can do about the ruling at this point? Do you know, I have made inquiries, okay. and I've been told that, you know, the record cannot be corrected. Ugh. Or not corrected, added to. You know, add this, because I will tell you, he and I did have a legal DNA done. Okay. Uh, by the same company that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uses today to establish paternity. Okay. And so we, and we did, we did do that. So, I mean, you know, there's no, there's no doubt. And, and what it means to have a legal DNA done is you both go to a lab, yep. present identification, and then, 
you know, the lab keeps um, track of that. So it, there's no way that somebody down the street uh, could could have given DNA and and right. and help give a wrong answer, you know, a wrong yeah. um, uh, result. That makes sense. So, but but I will tell you that that is something I'm very very interested in pursuing uh, as soon as I retire, as yeah. to whether or not that can be added to or amended be- or just something well, added to because, the record. Well, because because they yeah. say because of double jeopardy, you can't. You can't change it, but I'm thinking you mean you can't add this to the file. Right. You know, or an and addendum that, and or what, something. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that is something that my husband and I absolutely want to explore again once I'm retired and have a little bit of time sure. here, uh, <laughs> to do a little bit more. Needless to say, it's been a, a very busy last couple of years. Yeah. And <laughs> sure um, has. It has. And I mean, I even took ill with uh, Graves' disease. If you've ever heard of that, it's a thyroid condition. Oh, no. It's an auto, autoimmune condition. Well, it turns out my aunt, my father's only sister, uh, that I share so much DNA with her daughter, had uh, thyroid issues to the point where they had to remove her thyroid as uh-huh. well. See? Uh, I also, yes, isn't that interesting? Yep. I, I also found out that aortic aneurysms run in the family, that she and my grandfather both had them. Oh, okay. So, so I have learned so much medical yes. that, that is so important that literally I had no idea about. So no important. No idea. Yes. I mean, that, that alone should be something that takes precedence in identifying, uh, you know, who people are related to. I don't understand why it's still people still trying to keep secrets. Uh, Yeah. You know, I'm so grateful how I saw a cartoon one time in the last couple of years and it showed a wave crashing adoption records and, and, and other concealed, uh, documents mm-hmm. and it, and the wave was titled DNA. Uh-huh. And, and uh-huh. I, I am so grateful for that DNA wave oh, that is literally crashing down on all the secrets yeah. that, that have been kept from so many people, mm-hmm. you know, whether or not you want to know or, or not, I can tell you for me, this was an incredible longing my whole life. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel so very grateful. I mean, some people have said, well, you know, aren't you angry or bitter? Mm-hmm. I'm very grateful because I'll tell you something. I could not have imagined, and my mother certainly couldn't have imagined, that you would have, you know, a science that you would be able to spit into a tube, send it off, and then literally see uh, family trees come mm-hmm. to life with without that didn't require the father's cooperation. Yes. And, and you know, it's like the ultimate my, feminism, actually, if you look it at is. it, that it way. really, it really is. Uh, it really is. And, yeah. and also I think my mom's story again, really highlights a slice of women's history that many people are not familiar with. Uh-huh. I mean, I I've had so many people say, well, you know, I had no idea that they actually had laws on fornication and bastardy. Yeah. And it's like, I, I think you always need, again, I come from a government background and I think it's important to know what's transpired in the past and in order to make sure that it's not repeated in the future or for that matter, just to honor those who, who struggled before you. Right. Yeah. Wow. But you, uh, <laughs> I, I will tell you, I've, I've made a couple presentations uh, on my story, both to a women's group uh, and to a genealogy group. Mm-hmm. And, and I've ended it uh, the way I'll end uh, my conversation with you for right now. Okay. Uh, and, that, and that's that uh, you honor my mother uh, by allowing me to tell her story to you. And oh. so I really thank you for this opportunity. I You're really so do, welcome. So. I'm getting joked up. <laughs> Oh, please. Well, no, no, no. But I mean, I mean that uh, wholeheartedly. No, I really do. I mean, I'm, I have so, so many chills from this entire story. I can relate to it so much on so many levels that, um, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, well, thank you. you. Thank you. you. Came, agreed to tell the story to everybody, uh, to our listeners and to me. No, oh, well, thank you. Thank and you. And please keep in touch and tell us oh, of any please. updates, what happens. 
Okay, terrific. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, and that's the end of that. Wow, what a story. Isn't it amazing? Oh, my God. Yeah, it's. Uh, I really hope she takes it further. I really, really want her to um, look at legislation or look at getting something done with the record because I have experience with that. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I feel like there's there's things that I obviously I'm not going to get specific about it, but right. um, I, I there are things that as a genealogist I know I can go back and look at records for things that are made public. Yes, and if they're not accurate, uh, that would bother me that my descendants would see something that is not true. Right. Yeah, definitely. And they will... It's public record, sure. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, um, you know, and that's what bothers me most about it. So I'd like to be able to go back and, you know, do something do well, something about that. Let's hope that she does. Yes. And she's going to let us know if she does. And uh, I, I, I think she'll probably write a book. She definitely should. Yeah, that's book material, isn't it? It sure is. Sure is. Anyway, um, hey, let's get out of here. Okay. Well, then, in that case, I think you might want to know, Julie, that I, I, I am, do. my name is Richard Castle. Oh, oh is it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then you might want to go visit my website, um, richardcastle.com. That's www.richardcastle.com. <laughs> <laughs> On the interwebs. Um, <laughs> And or you may even want to, if you haven't already, follow nope. me on I don't. Twitter nope. at Castle Songs. Okay, fine. <laughs> I will. <laughs> hey, you can find me on Twitter at Jules Jackson with two O's. You can find the podcast, Cut Off Jeans Podcast, uh, at Cut Off Jeans Podcast. I keep forgetting to do that. And the Facebook group is Cut Off Jeans Podcast. And it's a secret group uh, or a private group, but you have to request to join because there's secret special things happening in there. <laughs> and of course, I always provide links to things I've talked about and uh, there's lots of conversations. There's always and, good discussion. Yes, um, and yes. always a good discussion. It's uh, a thoroughly enjoyable place to be. And I hang out there all the time. So if that's going to get you in there, come on in. You know what, Julie? I, I have to sign off now because I need to go to the dentist. I just lost a tooth. <gasps> and, yeah, and I don't know where to put it. <laughs> Rich. Yes? The tooth is in your jeans. <laughs> <laughs>